listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is September 29, 2017, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, the truth about pediatric contact dermatitis. Our presenter is Dr. Sharon Jacob. She's a professor of dermatology at Loma Linda University. Um, Today we're going to talk about uh, pediatric contact uh, dermatitis, but we'll also add in some adult things. This lecture is called The Truth About Pediatric Contact Dermatitis. I'm a professor of dermatology at Loma Linda University. Um, My disclosures are that I will be discussing um, a non-FDA approved procedure, which is comprehensive uh, patch testing in general. Uh, The True Test, which is the uh, commercially available kit, uh, was FDA approved in children on August 21st, so it is now approved in children and adults, Um, but I'll be mainly talking about comprehensive testing. I'm also founder and CEO of the Dermatitis Academy, which is a free web education site. It has um, webinars on it for free. It has... um, uh, allerg- each of the top 50 allergens has a dedicated page. It's made for providers and for um, uh, patients. And uh, I welcome you to take a look at the site if you have time. And then uh, I've served as an independent investigator for the safety and efficacy trials for the pediatric uh, division. And I've also been a speaker for uh, a number of different organizations that we've listed here. Um, And again, uh, for my research, I'm primary investigator on the Society for Pediatric Dermatology pilot project on the Pediatric Contact Dermatitis Registry. So I need to change this slide since uh, I submitted this before August 21st. So the FDA approved uh, 35 allergens. Uh, There's over 4,000 chemicals that we are exposed to in our daily lives. Um, One of the components on the FDA-approved kit is a negative control, which tests for the gel matrix that the allergens are uh, embedded in. Um, And I'm not going to read all of these, but these are the ones that are um, primarily, these these allergens cover about 70% of what we see on a routine basis in terms of uh, contact allergy. So these definitely are the ones to focus on. So the learning objectives for this lecture is to outline the approach to pediatric patients with recalcitrant dermatitis, talking about irritant contact, talking about allergic, and also the implications of atopic dermatitis. We'll discuss the top 10 allergens in the U.S. pediatric population, and I'm going to just mention in on the pediatric contact derm registry. So irritant contact dermatitis is one kind of contact dermatitis that the patient may recall a temporal event. Uh, The one on the left is lip licking, and um, the patient's tongue and saliva actually make this. So you can reenact this in the clinic and say, uh, can you show me how far you can reach with your tongue? And they will reach to the rim. One of the things that's important about this is you get this eczematous type of look, but you get retention of the vermilion border. So if you look at the lips here, you still have retention, whereas an allergic contact dermatitis of the lips you you tend to lose that vermilion border. This is an example of irritant dermatitis to cleaning supplies that are on uh, the toilet seat. And this is one of our residents that sent me this picture, and he's got this vesicular uh, dermatitis. He sent it to me on a Sunday, uh, and I just said to him, did you do anything different this week? And he said, no, just the same. And I said, any, by any chance have you uh, been working with bleach? And he had. He'd been bleaching the bathroom, and he'd splashed the bleach on himself. He hadn't remembered splashing the bleach when I uh, started asking him. And uh, he thought I had a glass ball, and I'd just kind of known what he'd been doing. But it's a, it's a typical type of look, and it's usually on the non-dominant hand because you're pouring with the right if you're right-handed. So allergic versus irritant contact dermatitis. When we break these two down, and it's important to do so, allergic is the more the less common. Um, it's the one that is a delayed type hypersensitivity reaction based in uh, Th1 cells. It requires a lipophilic low molecular weight haptin. Sensitization is required, meaning you have to see the chemical more than once to have the reaction. The concentration is independent. 
So what that means is that once you become sensitized, even a small amount of that allergen can trigger a response. We diagnose allergic contact dermatitis by patch testing. Irritant, on the other hand, is definitely the most common type of contact dermatitis, representing about 80%. This is a non-immunologic reaction. There is damage to the uh, keratinocytes, the um, bricks, so to speak, in the wall of the skin. And then uh, it's a dependent uh, type of reaction. So like in the example with the bleach, you know, the stronger, the, the more caustic, the chemical, then you will have a more robust reaction. And it's usually diagnosed by history and physical. In terms of the clinical features of allergic and irritant contact dermatitis, they both can be vesicular. They both can be chronic and lichenified. But allergic tends to have more induration, more vesicles, but it tends to occur not only locally, but spread, be, spread beyond the area of exposure as the T cells are called into the area. You can also see ectopic. So you could have a, a, an example with um, cell phones or uh, with uh, toys where the child plays with the toys and then scratches the atopic dermatitis, and now we have the nickel from the toys in the dermatitis. It can also generalize. In terms of symptoms, allergic tends to itch, um, whereas irritant tends to burn. And that's a very important um, key uh, feature. In terms of latency of reaction, allergic tends to, it can occur earlier than 48 hours if it's a very potent allergen and that patient is highly sensitized. However, in most instances, it takes 72 to 120 hours before the reaction occurs. And it usually takes several weeks to resolve. Um, irritant, on the other hand, usually occurs within 48 hours. The stronger the irritant, the more quickly and robust the reaction occurs. And it's often diminished by 96 hours. It gets, it gets improved. So this um, is I'm not going to read all of this, but what I want to show you and what comes through in many different occupations is that detergents are one and solvents are the top um, irritants in many, many different occupations, from hospital workers to dentists to cleaners to artists. So my, my son, talking about irritating, my son um, and I were driving to school one day and he kept asking me for more transformers. I need more transformers. I need, I only have 68. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, I'm not buying him anymore. And this popped up on my phone. And I showed it to him to break his constant request for transformers. And he said, what is that little man doing? I said, that's not a little man, that's, that's a boy. And he said, but why is he pushing on the sheep? I said, he has to get all those sheep home or he doesn't get dinner tonight. And he said, oh. And then I realized I had him engaged. So I said, and this little boy uh, lives in a house. He lives in a hut. He doesn't, he sleeps on the floor. And my son says, oh. And then I said, and this little boy has no transformers, to which he replied, he's got the meanest parents on the planet. So the point of this is that what does your life expose you to? What in your work? What in your lifestyle? So I played marbles as a kid, and I, I, I don't know how many of you did, but it was a big deal. Um, we used to spend hours doing it and you know try to collect all the daubers, the big ones. But in the third world, they don't have glass cat eyes, and they don't have some of the, the, the toys we have. So what do people think that people use in the third world? Rocks. Yeah, rocks is a good one. Now, I've tried to play with rocks. They don't roll too well. Rocks are sure. good for hopscotch. Ha! How about anything else? Hmm. Round. Yeah, something round. Yeah. yeah, so the favorite round thing is seeds. Does anybody know what kind of seeds these are? So this is the fan leaf of ginkgo biloba. And the ginkgo seed is actually a very popular marble. And this is actually a dinosaur fecalis because ginkgos are the oldest trees on the planet. Wow. 
So why do we think about ginkgo biloba? Well, ginkgo biloba has a chemical in it that is very similar to the urushiol in poison ivy. Um, we always talk about leaves of three, let them be. If you look here in these pictures, you see these black dots. And what that is is the oleoresin actually coming through and oxidizing um, on the leaf. What's important about this is that patients who run through poison ivy or over here we have poison oak can actually get those black dot dermatitis. They'll also get the oleoresin that has um, oxidized. So it can help you determine a urushiol dermatitis. So urushiol is quite rampant. This is uh, mango. And remember the, mind of, uh, the rind of the mango has that same chemical as um, the poison ivy. So you want to make sure you're not biting the uh, fruit off the rind. You always want to cut the rind off. Does anybody know what this is? No. Those are pistachios. So pistachios also have a urushiol in them. So here's an example of urushiol dermatitis. Why is this important? Because again, you're seeing that effacement of the vermilion border. You're seeing the swelling. You are getting vesiculation, but just the smoothing out. This is a good signal that we're looking at an allergic contact dermatitis. So this is a recent report that came, uh, actually a report that came out of Israel. And 17 of 32 Americans that had been employed mango picking in um, Israel had developed this type of reaction, but none of the 30 Israeli youth um, had, that had participated developed the dermatitis. So why was that and, and what was the triggering event? So it was speculated that the Americans who all reported that they had had poison ivy as a kid and had repeatedly um, been exposed had a, a exuberant um, cross-reactivity between the mango and the um, poison ivy and had had this reaction. So just to show you that the earlier you are sensitized, the more likely that impact is going to have uh, lifelong. So what do children spend their time doing? What are they exposed to? So the most important thing, especially in a topic dermatitis, because we are treating that dermatitis with topicals, emollients, and medicaments, is that we remember that the personal hygiene products and the things we use to treat atopic dermatitis are the most likely thing that they're going to become allergic to because we're putting those vehicle chemicals into dermatitic skin. The other things are toys, electronics, and coins. So toys, there's a um, study that was done in 2014 that showed that 34% of children's toys purchased in the U.S. contained enough releasable nickel to cause reaction. This is extremely important because the nickel that is released from the toys is deposited in the skin. So this is my son. We finally got him to stop doing this activity, but he would count his money every day. But then so would you if you live with his two sisters, because he's the only one earning money, and they keep wanting his money. Now he's switched to paper, which is costing us more money. But for a while there, he, he was counting his money every day. So how long do you think that it takes uh, touching coins? How many times a week do you think you need to do it before it impacts? This picture showing. Oh, sorry. Do you, ha do you have an idea? I would think over, you know, like half an hour to an hour, maybe? You'd think yeah, a lot. exactly. That, yeah, that was what I was thinking, too. But they actually did a study, and it's 10 minutes on three occasions within two weeks or 30 minutes on one occasion. So that is significant because I was thinking a couple of hours as well. So coins can be, a, and a lot of children uh, count coins. That's actually been kindergarten homework was uh, a lot of coin usage. So I was like, oh my goodness, our schools are, you know, encouraging this nickel exposure early on without realizing it. So I actually donated a huge box of plastic coins to the school that look like these, they look identical, but they're plastic. I was like, okay, I've got to have an intervention here. Allergy to PPD is act, uh, uh, in black henna tattoos has actually come, the reports have come down since the M, uh, FDA launched the med alert uh, campaign. Um, this we were starting to see in clinic where people were putting what, what's called the, the tramp tattoo on babies. 
Um, we did a public health awareness about this, and uh, black-handed tattoos should never be used on children. Uh, it's really not safe. Paraphenylene diamine is uh, the most potent sensitizer um, on the kit. It highly binds the skin. Uh, this is a patient that I had patch tested who had had a blistering reaction on her scalp to hair dye. Um, this was um, a teaching point for me because now if somebody comes in and they've had a blistering reaction, I don't embed the paraphenylene diamine in the rest of the hair dressing kit or the North American. What I do is I separate that out onto the arm and if um, they have any kind of, they tell me any kind of, you know, itching and it's really bothering them, I go ahead and let them take that down at 24 hours. I still get a positive, but this patient had actually gotten a scar from this, so um, I'm more careful now in how I test paraphernalia diamine. So exposed areas and location. The face and the hands are obviously the highest exposure areas because they are um, exposed to the outside world. What's really interesting also is this airborne phenomenon, and we do see it with our atopic children. So methyl isothiazolazone, or MI, is a preservative that um, is actually going to be um, banned um, in Levon products <clears throat> in Europe next year. We're still behind on that. Um, fragrance and Bronopol are all known to be volatile and airborne. What's interesting to me is that Bronopol and MI are both used as preservatives in latex paint or household paints. So I have seen atopic dermatitis patients who've had full-blown reactions because they're also allergic to MI or Bronopol, and it's also reported in Europe. I haven't reported it, but I've seen it, where they'll get full-blown uh, reactions after a new painting of a home. So that's something to keep in mind. And then connubial contact dermatitis, we always think about husband and wife, but it's all of these three, fragrance, PPD, and nail polish, has all been reported as a connubial-like reaction in children. Paraphenylene di diamine, was reported in a subset of two-year-olds who were co-sleeping with their parent, with their mom, and each time the mom dyed her hair, the, quote, atopic dermatitis flared in the two-year-old. So that, that was an interesting report. And then children uh, do have a lot of footwear dermatitis um, due to rubbers, chromates, but the number one is paraturt butyl formaldehyde resin, which is a glue. This is a child that I had um, uh, taken care of. This reaction here in this circle is actually from mom's perfume on her neck where um, the, the baby was cradling her face in the mom's neck. So she's got effacement of the vermilion border. Um, we got mom to stop uh, using fragrances and she got better. This is after. About a year later, she had started using vanilla teething cookies a year after this, and she had a full flare. Uh, we went back and tested her, and she was allergic to vanilloids, both in her mom's perfume and in the cookies. So we can see cross reactions that way. Some specific locations. This is um, some insights from Kathy Green that I thought were nice. Um, perioral dermatitis, you want to think about food additives, fragrances, preservatives, detergents. And when I say detergents, I'm thinking like cocamidopropyl betaine, um, which is often in toothpaste. One of the things I do for perioral and lip dermatitis is, you know, we tell patients, use this emollient, use uh, this moisturizer, use this lip balm. We tell them to do that. Um, oftentimes, patients will put that on after they clean their teeth, so I actually tell them to put it on before to make sure the toothpaste and mouthwash ingredients are not getting on the lip. When we see peri-umbilical or waistline dermatitis, we want to think about nickel and cobalt with, and chromate um, and isothiazolazones. OIT is a type of isothiazolazone because all of those can be in uh, leather, and we do see um, that uh, those causing reactions in the waistline. For eyelids, we want to think about fragrances and preservatives. We've had uh, we had a series of vulvar dermatitis. Uh, Magentol is a fragrance that is often used in sanitary napkins and also in tampons, so we do see those types of reactions. Uh, we often see them earlier uh, in teens because that's when they first start using those chemicals. 
And then colophony can be in the glue, as can methyl isothiazolazone in the sanitary napkin. Back of the thighs, you want to think about toilet seat, chair studs. Um, under the shin guard is usually an irritant dermatitis from friction and sweat with the rubber. However, rubber accelerators and biocides have been reported. Modeling clay, um, play gels uh, can have fragrances in them. We also see paints for children. Plasticine um, is like a type of Play-Doh, and there is MI um, sometimes in plasticine, and it isn't actually always on the label. And then we already talked about black henna tattoos. So this was a new allergen that was identified in Europe um, last year. So um, this is acetophenone azine. Now this isn't very commonly tested in the U.S., but I, I do have workarounds for most, uh, most of these things um, because the problem is if you go and tell the patient or the parent the shin guard uh, is, is the problem, they go get a different shin guard, but it has the same rubber or the similar components. So um, biocides can, are sprayed onto the rubbers to stop things growing. Um, otherwise, they would grow fungus and bacteria because of the amount of moisture that occurs on the shin guards. So what I have the patients do is I have them put duct tape over the rubber. My son does not have shin guard dermatitis. He plays a lot of soccer, but he does have his shin guards already coated. The other thing you can do is to... Um, to put a canvas overlay and you can glue it down with um, acrylate onto the shin guard. But that, the problem with that is it gets wet and can harbor bacteria. So um, I prefer the duct tape. And then you can wipe it down um, after the game. But I also have the, the child, my son specifically, uh, wear his socks under the shin guard and then another pair over. So he has to double sock for soccer, but I want to prevent him from getting um, a shin guard dermatitis. Remember with asymmetrical distribution, it can be a key. Uh, for one cheek, for example, it could be the mobile phone, for one hand, the computer mouse, one wrist could also be the uh, keyboard rest. We do see double wrist in people who use um, laptop computers with a metal finish and that is usually from nickel. One palm and fingertips is often wiped, and it's usually the dominant hand. Asymmetrical um, is, is really a good clue oftentimes. So this lady, this is an older, uh, an older phone that they were using, has a flip phone. The, the nickel button um, actually caused an ectopic dermatitis because the nickel was rubbing. It was only one button, but um, where the sweat and the, uh, the pressure and friction caused that nickel to actually get onto the other side of the flip phone, so she got both. She also had the earring dermatitis, and she had this periaxillary band dermatitis. Now, what was interesting to me is her right underarm was far more affected than the left, and the reason for that is she was right-handed. So when she was shaving, she was having to go multiple passes um, on the right side, so she got more exposure from her razor. So whenever possible, you want to use the temporal associations and try to fulfill Cox postulates. So here this patient comes in for an evaluation of a rash. This, um, in retrospect, it's, it's easy to see all the studs on the chair. We patch test them. We get the positive to nickel. We avoid the chair, and they get better. But sometimes it can be looking for a needle in a haystack. Sometimes it's, you know, hindsight 2020. So where are we at? So in um, 2008 was the first two studies published on allergic contact dermatitis in affected children in the U.S. Prior to that, we only had contact sensitization studies, which means patch testing in a well person. So in the U.S., Weston did a study and Bruckner did a study on well children and found that 20% um, in both studies had a positive patch test. So what we did when we started out was we went through the literature and we said, let's look up literary, uh, literary uh, citations by allergen and try to come up with a top 10. So this is how many citations for each allergen. But the problem with this is for every one reported, there's many, many more. But these are top allergens in children that you would want to make sure are being tested. Again, this is our standard. So what we came out with was a basic 
pediatric screen, we actually came up with the top 20 prevalent and relevant allergens in children as a bare minimum screen. And when we compared this to our data, uh, we realized that we would have had a 52% failure to detect the allergens um, if we had only done those 20. Now, what's important to remember is that uh, we have a referral bias within our population in that many of our children have received the commercially available, available kit by the time they see us, so we already are um, looking for allergens beyond that kit. So in 2008, these are the two studies that came out, one by the North American Contact Derm Group and one by the UPenn uh, UMiami Group, and you see there's a, a similarity in top allergens. So these are definitely the ones that we want to be testing for. Nickel is highly prevalent. 25% uh, of the, the children that were referred to the North American Contact Derm Group did have nickel. And remember, nickel is on the commercially available kit, but often these children had atopic dermatitis with widespread dermatitis, so they had been sent in for without being patch tested. This is the um, breakdown of where those studies came from. You can see that um, the circles are the North American Contact Derm Group, and you can see that there is a specific band of the population where they are reporting from. These are the Canadians who are on the North American Contact Derm Group. Now remember, 50% of the North American Contact Derm Group data comes from Canada. So you see there's a specific band here. This is one provider out in um, uh, San Francisco, um, and then we have um, another provider that has since retired in Florida. But you see, this explains why there is an 85% an um, non-Hispanic white population reported in their data, because that's what's prevalent in the areas where the testing is being done. So the Pediatric Contact Dermatitis Registry study, um, we invited, uh, and we, we have now transitioned over to PEDRA, which is the uh, research arm of the Society for Pediatric Dermatology. This is a study based in Loma Linda. Uh, it, U.S. providers were invited to, through societal blast telephone engagement flyers to complete an 11-question uh, registration, and then they had the option to um, ca enter cases into the registry. So um, in that first year of the study, we got 252 registered providers that confirmed they were doing pediatric patch testing. So we really got a wide distribution of the country. So when we looked at who was in that 252, we see that dermatologists made up a large component. Uh, internal medicine made up about 10%, and these are mainly allergists. And then when we look at the breakdown, we see that 43% are in academics, and then the other component that's large is private practice. Now, it just turns out this way that more um, of the literature comes from people in academics versus uh, private practice. So we are missing this population in our, um, in our, in our literature. So um, the Pediatric Contact Dermatitis Registry the first year had over 1,000 patients reported in. 552 patients had atopic dermatitis, which actually formed quite a nice control group. And again, that's just what was reported in. We didn't specifically say just report atopic or non-atopic, but just what got reported in. The mean age was 10 years of age, with testing down to seven months. Children with atopic dermatitis were 16.9 times more likely to have a positive patch test than the children without. The children with atopic dermatitis were 109 times more likely to have generalized dermatitis. And if you looked at the commercially available kit, it would have missed 30%. So the commercially available kit was um, uh, being able to detect about 70% of the allergens. So then we looked at the, the population breakdown for the pediatric contact dermatitis registry versus the, um, the, US, the demographics of the United States. And we see that, again, this, this wasn't controlled for. It was just what people were reporting in. But by um, surveying the entire country, we got a more accurate breakdown of um, ethnic and, and racial um, breakdown because we have 57% uh, white um, non-Hispanics in the 
pediatric contact germ registry, and 51% of that, uh, that population represented in the country. And then we were able to get a large detection rate in our Hispanic patients. So what we confirmed with um, our study, and uh, what was interesting is that our study and the North American Contact Derm Group study both had 48% um, of rate of confirmed sensitization. The difference, however, was that in the North American Contact Derm Group, and that was their entire group, adults and children, their average age was 48, whereas when we looked at the children, the average age was 10 and a half or 11. What it also reinforced that was the common allergens in adults were common in children. So when it comes to um, atopic dermatitis and allergic contact dermatitis, patients with atopic dermatitis in our group had a longer history of dermatitis before they were evaluated. So most patients with atopic dermatitis waited about three and a half years before they were patch tested, whereas the ones without atopic dermatitis, the children waited about at uh, 1.8 years. Patients with atopic dermatitis had a much higher frequency uh, of reaction to cocomedal propyl betaine, lanolin, pivolate, and parthenolide. Now what's interesting is these all have been reported in Europe as well. The cocomedal propyl betaine it's a detergent. It's, an, it's the no tears ingredient in baby shampoo. It's in a lot of our sensitive skin um, uh, soap bars. So it's also in toothpaste. It's one of those that actually bind and get into the skin of atopic dermatitis patients um, uh, more easily. So uh, Don Belcito out in New York actually has a paper that says cocomedal purple betaine should not be used in patients with atopic dermatitis. And they had confirmed this as well. Lanolin is sheep sebum. It's used in a lot of our over-the-counter preparations for emollients. Um, it is a big trigger in our atopics. Tixocortopivolate is the screening chemical for hydrocortisone. And remember, a lot of these atopic patients have used hydrocortisone over-the-counter, so that makes sense. And then the parthenolide. The parthenolide is an interesting one. That is a component of compositate flowers, um, such as daisies and um, chrysanthemums are, are in that family. Artichokes also in that family and endive. What's interesting to me is that dandelions are in that group as well. And uh, I have pictures of my kids. They should have been wearing helmets diving for that one you know, dandelion in the field that they both had to have. But it turns out the stem of the dandelion has a significant amount of this uh, sesquiterpene lactone chemical, which parthenolide is one of them. And we went back. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we patch tested our patients with composite, parthenolide, sesquiterpene, lactone. And it turns out that some of them were missed because it was more specific to the dandelion. So um, we believe dandelion extract should be tested in our atopics. Um, remember, there's a significant reaction pattern to uh, personal hygiene products. And then patients with atopic dermatitis actually had a lower frequency of reaction to <coughs> methyl isothiazolazone. Now this is because the potency of the allergens can have an impact. So I'm just going to drink some water here. <coughs> so MI is a very is quite a strong allergen. And when it comes to atopic dermatitis, weak allergens can play a more impactful role, and that has to do with the Th1, Th2 imbalance. So this explains why a lot of the literature used to say atopics don't get contact dermatitis, allergic contact dermatitis, but the allergen that you're testing with matters. This is another um, part of our study, and this is interesting. <clears throat> because we saw that patch testing rates generally increased with age. The one exception to this were, were black males. They did not follow this trend. We saw black males being tested early on, but not somehow making it to testing later. When you look at duration of dermatitis, there was also um, a, a wide range. The black patients notably had an even longer delay in access to patch test evaluation. The um, black children waited 1.46 
years longer than white children and 1.6 years longer than Hispanic children. When we looked at the allergens by race, you see that in our Hispanic population, the personal hygiene products um, really, uh, well, in all of them, personal hygiene products came up as top allergens in 89%. But we saw a statistically significant um, reaction to Wolax, alcohols, and tixacortal, which are in your emollients and your hydrocortisone in our Hispanic population. Sometimes it feels like a Dr. House episode. You know, I found a picture. I didn't manage to get it in here, but I, I, if I'm invited again back next year, I have to show you because it's funny. But it's a lady looking, you know, a, a lady looking into a glass ball. And sometimes I feel like I need a glass ball when some of these patients come in and say, "Do I have allergic contact dermatitis?" And it's obvious they have atopic dermatitis predisposition. They've got Denny Morgan lines around their eyes. They've got hyperlinear palms. Um, they're more widespread but you have to dig for that needle in the haystack. So this is the patient that came in. Um, he has this spare zone on his lip, and it turns out he was an avid drinker of soda. And where the soda bottle was protecting his lip when he was drinking, he actually um, didn't have the dermatitis. But what was interesting when we patch tested him, he turned out to be allergic to sodium benzoates, which are a preservative in the soda that he was drinking. So we got him better, and then he ate an entire can of baked beans, and he flared again. But when he flared, this is his baked bean reaction, he did not flare where that soda bottle had protected him. I looked through the baked beans, and there were um, on the can, not the beans themselves, and there was um, sodium benzoates in the, in the beans. So he, he, his reaction pattern recurred. So how do we approach the child with a allergic contact dermatitis? I used to always say be quick, but um, that's kind of um, a joke because you really can't be quick with children. You do need to take your time and make sure you reinforce the patches. So we do this, what we call avoiding the shriek with Shrek, and we put the video on. They sit watching it. They have no idea they have stickers on. Now, I learned early on to show children what was going to happen to them because after we got them all taped up, a lot of the children were so mad they didn't know what we were doing, they took their patches off. So we actually have a little video we have them watch so they know what's going to happen. You want to make sure to have handouts both pre-patch and post-patch. You want to make sure you're being clear on expectations. Uh, you want to talk about the consult visit that they're going to need to return for three procedure visits um, and one follow-up. And then disclose the positive possibility of a negative patch test. So one of the things that I've been doing in my clinic, now everybody seems to have a cell phone, is that I actually photograph on the last day of the read, I photograph the patient's back and I give it to on their own phone or their mother's phone father's phone, whoever brings the phone, and I tell them if anything comes up in the next three weeks to take a picture in the exact same location on the back and send me both. And I'm able to use that because my marks are still on on their phone, and um, I'm able to um, look to see if we've got delayed, delayed reactions. In terms of instructions, I do tell um, patients not to take um, steroids um, prior to the patch test and not on the back within a week. Antihistamines are okay, and sun and UV are a no-no because it uh, blunts the ability of the longer Han cells to react. Now, with the steroids, that said, I do um, patch test transplant patients, both um, adult and pediatric, and if they are immunosuppressed in getting a rash, they and they are on prednisone, I don't take them off it, um, but I do tell them that there's a possibility that we will have a blunted reaction. So if their dermatitis flares during the patch test, I make sure that they treat it, and I'm pretty aggressive about treating two or three times a day with the topical steroid to make sure we are redirecting those T cells from the known area of dermatitis to the back where they um, where we're patch testing because they don't want to get a false negative. So you want to ask the question, is the patient right for patch testing? Is there a possible other diagnosis? 
um, and you want to make sure that the parent and the patient understand that they may have to avoid some things. I've had patients tell me they're not changing their behavior um, and, and they're not giving up this and they're not giving up that. And that becomes a, a very difficult place to be. You try to do workarounds, but you want to make sure you have a commitment from the patient. We talked about the systemic um, corticosteroids. I've had patients come in who are extremely poor historians and there's a, such a strong education component. I don't patch test if they're, they can't give a consistent history or they're very um, uh, disorganized. I, we will take the time to do education up front and get them on simple and free and then bring them back. I'll talk, I'll talk a little bit about simple and free in a moment. And then erythrodermic patients, I don't patch test. I usually do um, cyclosporin or cell sets. I treat them. I get them to the point where their rash is going away. Then I wean them to where their rash is just starting to come back and then patch test them. Make sure to use the history to direct allergen selection. You want to re ask always where did the dermatitis begin and look for those original sites at the time of patch testing. Look for them to recur. Um, always look for regional clues, um, asymmetry, um, document current active dermatitis, and photograph the patient. I have a questionnaire um, that's a basic questionnaire is that, uh, and then an allergen questionnaire. So I will ask them history questions. For example, does, um, have you had, ever had a reaction to jewelry? Has metal against your skin ever caused a reaction? And if you get a yes answer to that, it's a positive predictor that they probably are going to have a nickel uh, positive test. When it comes to approaching the pediatric patient, you have to remember the child's environment not only includes their personal hygiene products, but like the mom with the perfume, the, the caregivers as well, as well, and the daycare and after school activities. We look for um, temporal associations. This is a patient that used to shave the enamel off their pencil, and um, they actually had a reaction to the colophony. Um, this is a, a patient with perioral dermatitis, and he was allergic to the vanilloids. And unfortunately, we gave him a, a vanilla a lollipop in my clinic, the, one of our, our, our staff did. And I said, oh, no, no, you, you shouldn't have that. And then he started crying. So I've become more sensitive um, in, in my aged years of doing this. Um, and plus, uh, since that beginning, I now have children. So they've taught me a whole lot about saying when to say no to things. Um, and remembering the approach to the pediatric patient and geographic clues, a new dermatitis that's getting worse, or a chronic dermatitis on the hands, eyelid, and face definitely deserves evaluation. You do need more um, patience and time with the pediatric patients because you're also um, uh, dealing with the patient in the room. Now, early on, um, I used to be uh, do the Alexander Fisher method, which was less than five years old. We would reduce the concentrations of nickel formaldehyde in the rubber additives. I don't do that anymore, and I also don't do the sodium lauryl sulfate irritant control that I used to do in the early years. Um, what I do now is um, I, I rationalize to myself that since their skin was um, not developed the same way as an adult um, and they were absorbing more, um, then that was the reason to reduce the concentrations. I rationalize that by um, putting the patches on for only 24 hours in this population rather than 48, that it would be the same absorption. And it turns out that I get the same results. So under six, I don't leave it on for 48 hours. I only leave it on for 24. Um, and I, I do get the same, and I don't do mixing. So that, that's made things more efficient because I don't have to um, one, I don't have to mix the chemicals, which takes longer, but it also makes it so the child is less uncomfortable because they have the patches on less time. The other thing is I get less background because by putting these occlusions on with our atopic patients, we start to grow staff. We have a whole paper on it that I could send if anyone's interested, but by growing staff, we make the skin more dermatitic and we get a much more difficult patch test reading because now our patches are hidden in the dermatitis of the um, eczema of the atopic dermatitis. Reasons not to patch test, the family de defers patch testing, they're uh, unwilling to do some preemptive avoidance. Um, 
failure to obtain consent, I do consent for all the pediatric ones and then oral corticosteroids. Uh, reasons two patch tests, deteriorating der dermatitis, increasing total body surface area. I do patch test patients with dyshydrotic eczema and uh, patients that are recalcitrant, meaning they're trying to use standard therapies and they're just not getting better. So these are some of our patients um, that had recalcitrant dermatitis. This patient ended up being allergic to lanolin, which was in the emollient that they were putting on his face. This one ended up being allergic to grandma's perfume and to some of the fragrances in his baby products. This patient was allergic to the wipes and shampoo that they were using. You can see the shampoo collection above the ears. In this picture, he's on cyclosporin and steroids, and I didn't believe the parents were giving him his cyclosporin because I couldn't believe how reactive he was. So I checked the trough level, and he definitely was taking it. We got him to avoid, we patch tested him on the cyclosporin, got him to avoid uh, the wipes and the shampoo, and he got better. This patient was a challenge because he was allergic to the elastic in his socks, which were also in his rubber shoes. So um, he he would end up wearing um, shoes, and I started a campaign that you should always wear socks with rubber boating shoes. When we think about widespread idiopathic responses, we want to think about nickel, balsam of Peru, formaldehyde, and cocomedal propylbutane. And this is that um, Dr. Belcito paper where 80 patients should avoid the use of skincare products containing cocomedal propylbutane. Again, because the skin in atopic seems to absorb this chemical more, more quickly. And multiple chemical sensitivity, we get a lot of patients referred for this. This patient, 17 positives on his patch test. He graduated from college this year. I still keep in, in touch with the family. He cleared up all formaldehyde releasers. So uh, of those 17, uh, eight of them were related to formaldehyde. This is the preemptive avoidance strategy, or PEAS um, is what we call it. Um, we review national pediatric data um, from the last five years, and now we update it annually. And we outline the top allergens found in pediatric personal care products. It also works for adults. Um, it's just that I, I, I tend to um, be more strict in getting the kids to do this. What's interesting is 30% of our patients get better by trying PEAS. Well, it makes sense because those are the top allergens. So this is the data for the 2006 um, P's, and these are the top allergens that are in personal care products. What is most important about this in the STARS is that the starred allergens are missing from the commercially available kit. So if you patch test and you get a negative, and then you do the P's and they get better, then it's it's probably one of these. So these starred chemicals are the ones that I would recommend are used as a panel next to the kit. Now, fragrance mixed to the bold ones are the ones that are not on the patch on the uh, commercially available kit. Um, the uh, balsam of Peru is on the kit, but it only detects about 70 to maximum 80 percent of the patients with that allergen based on how it is in the gel matrix. Methyl chloroisothiazolazone and MI, methyl isothiazolazone, are on the commercially available kit, but the MI is in such a low concentration compared to what you actually need, it's 0.01 instead of 0.2, you miss 50% of MI reactions using the commercially available kit. So if you're going to use the kit, try to do a side panel with another 10 allergens. So here's your kit. Here's comprehensive testing, so you can do the kit and just add 10 more and increase your detection rate from about 70% to about 85%. Remember to test personal care products at the same time. You can either do a repeat open application test where you're putting, having the patient put it on two times a day for seven days, or you can actually put the components on the patient. These are just comparing the comprehensive versus the commercially available kit. And um, they're both difficult for the patient to do because they both require three visits. But there's the, the kit doesn't require specifically uh, trained staff. When it comes to both of them, they both have deficiencies. Um, the, the, the kit is better for nickel. Formaldehyde is marginally better for comprehensive testing. And um, both of them miss 
methyl isothiazolazone if it's not tested alone. We talked about video distraction assist. Um, this is me putting um, patch test on a 10-month-old, and these are the micros. So I can usually only get about 20 allergens on a, a small child. Remember to have the patient return 24 hours if they're under 6, um, if you want to use that protocol, and 48 hours if they're over 6. And remember to reinforce them with hyperfix. Knowing how to read your test, macular erythema can be relevant, so make sure to document those. This is a 1 plus reaction. This is a 2 plus where it's starting to expand beyond the, the patch test, and this is a 3 plus reaction. 3 plus reactions do not necessarily mean they are relevant. I check for in duration, so I turn off the lights. This is extremely important in darker skin where erythema might be harder to see. So we turn off the lights and seal. There are variations that occur within an individual patient. And then we want to ask, was patch testing useful? Did we get a positive reaction and a rash that got worse? You hope the rash that they have got worse because that confirms that you have got the right thing. But a positive reaction um, doesn't necessarily mean anything if you can't clinically um, make it, find a clinical relevance. Be aware of false positive reactions. These are usually irritant reactions. This is cobalt, which has oxidized in the hair follicle. Be aware of false negatives. So reasons for false negatives, improper contact, and an improper read. So if you um, only do a reading at 48 hours, you're likely to miss delayed reactions. Remember to have the patient, the little one, um, uh, distracted during the education session. So some pearls, you want strategic streamlining, you want to have a pre-consult, questionnaire, fact sheet, and instruction sheet. I have them watch instructional videos, and here's some places where those can be found. Um, remember to test their own products. Give them a contact allergen management program output sheet or an allergen avo avoidance information sheet at the end of patch testing, and make sure they're getting rid of the bad products. And purchase, the, and purchase the right one. I want to just show you one last thing here. Um, the best prevention strategies are moderation. Um, we are working on legislation for nickel still, and then education is definitely the key. We estimate that 200,000 children currently are sensitized to nickel in the U.S., and what's amazing about this is it's preventable. I want to thank you for having me and take a moment for a couple of questions. Thank you. Does anyone have a question here? I don't think so. That's a great Excellent. picture. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.